more and more frequently new papers come out from academia and research labs announcing massive new language models capable of analyzing huge amount of information. This information is mostly in text format, but LLMs capable of ingesting videos and, and audio are also starting to appear. This is extremely exciting for the industry, and yet there is a chance that these models might become obsolete in the future. Yang Lecun is the chief AI scientist at Meta, and this is what he has to say about LLMs. So that's the future architecture of AI systems. And in my opinion, once you figure out how to make this work, nobody in their right mind would use autoregressive LLMs anymore. <laughs> Lecun is not the only one to believe that larger language models are just a transition to more advanced tools. Right now, these models are, I, I, hope to, I, not to, I don't want to misinterpret, they're much more stupid than many people assume. They don't, they don't Sam understand. Altman has called them incompetent helpers. Well, of course, they don't understand the world. They can't reason. They can't plan. They don't know the meaning of the words that they produce. They are, they're actually tokens. Mm -hmm. They're highly, highly sophisticated, versatile, sort of autocomplete systems. But we should be careful not to anthropomorphize artificial intelligence. It's really, it's kind of, we confer almost our own intelligence on something which does not have human level intelligence. Now, there's a debate. And as we heard from the interruption, the representatives from Meta are not the only ones to believe that large language models are not smart. LLMs are really good when you have a lot of data. We download that data from the web, Wikipedia, Reddit, X, all kinds of sources of content. We train the AI model and it has language fluency. Wonderful. But what if you don't have data? What if you want to create a new molecule? You're a drug company, you're a biotech company. What if you want to create a new material, an alloy, you want to lightweight your vehicle because you're an automotive company or an aerospace company? There is no data set to download from the internet. If there were, we already have that new material. And so we now need to go to a different kind of AI, an AI where we actually generate data. 2023, definitely the year of Gen AI, but 2024 starts the era of Gen data, generative data. LLMs by themselves are not going to be enough. The only way you can get that done is if there's a paradigm shift away from the chip and into a whole new computer. Even only a few days before OpenAI unveiled its latest product, the text-to-video generation tool Sora, Sam Altman was a remote guest at the World Government Summit and said, with a very effective metaphor, that we are still in the early phase of a much bigger revolution. The current technology that we have is like I mean, it's like that very first cell phone with the black and white screen that can only display those like numbers and, you know, it just didn't do much. But there was enough in there, you're like, hmm, I can make a call, that's, that's cool, and at the time that seems great. And then it took us, I don't know how long from that, but many decades from that to the iPhones we have today. And the thing we have today is incredible, and it took a massive amount of scaling in all these different ways to get there. Um, but we have now is like unimaginable at the time of those like first primitive cell phones. And I think that's, that's where we have to push forward. We're at this barely useful cell phone. But people still like making phone calls, it turns out. And if you can make a better way for them to do it so they can go walk around the world while they do it, sure, that's great. But that's not what we want to deliver. We want to deliver the iPhone 16 or 15 or whatever the current one is. For the record, and to answer to Sam Altman, at the time of his comments, the iPhone on the market was the iPhone 15. Pietro Perona is a renowned professor at Caltech, and he summarizes the reason why we need a different approach if we want to have machines that can interact with the world. Right now, we have been <coughs> over-indexing for you know, very good reasons on the intelligence we can get out of analyzing batches of data that is available on the internet. Right now we are poisoned by correlations and we don't uh, know how to build machines that can understand causation. And to understand causation, fundamentally, you've got to allow the machines to carry out experiments. And, um, uh, and so why so? Well, because um, if you're a non-embodied agent, well, prediction is all you, what you, all you need to do, and, and correlations are very good for prediction, but if you need to change the world, and so you need to do intervention, 
that it understand the causes of things and then causation is fundamental, being able to reason about that. These new approaches are not just needed, but are part of the natural evolution of technology. And this idea is confirmed also by an authority in technology evolution, Ray Kurzweil, who was a guest at a recent event organized by the International Telecommunication Union. Well, large language models are actually going to go beyond just language. They're already bringing in pictures, videos, and so on. And I mean, a lot of predictions of the future take today's large language models and just assume nothing's going to happen. And that's been true at every different point. People assume that the current technology is just going to remain and ignore the fact that it's really on a very sharp increase. You know, three years from now, it's going to be a whole different type of technology. You're going to have to reinvent it. And, that, and that's what we do with technology. Even if we don't know what exactly the future holds, the researchers know what the final scenario looks like. We still have some breakthroughs to get through. You know, AGI, whatever you want to call it, human-level AI, is not just around the corner. There's no question it will happen. There's no question that at some point in the future, we will have machines that are smarter than us in all domains where we're smart. They'll be working for us. They're not going to want to you know, take over the world. Uh, but uh, you know, we'll set their their goals, um, and they, they'll be executing those goals for us. But uh, but they will be smarter than us in many ways. Um, but we're not there yet. You know, we we still have to discover some major breakthroughs before before we get there. Just to recap, language models fall under the discipline of machine learning and are the foundation of today's most talked about applications in AI, like OpenAI ChatGPT. Google Gemini, but also many other AI tools that aim at improving your writing, your coding skills, or boost your productivity. These tools take advantage of the prediction capabilities of these models, and the way they work will become more clear in the course of this video. Jan LeCun is probably the most frequently invited speaker that is vocal about the limits of large language models, since they became a trendy topic. For example, to those that support the idea that more intelligence is gained as large language models become even larger, the Hune basically responds the size does not matter. He argues that even if a language model gets larger or it can process an enormous amount of text, it still cannot learn to do practical things. Le Kuhn presented his views more recently at the World Economic Forum in Davos, and then at the World Government Summit, and then again at the World AI Conference in France. But he started even earlier, and his opinion has not changed. In recent times, the, the use of uh, large language models that are trained in a self-supervised manner just to predict the next word in a text, trained on gigantic amounts of text, and we see this emergent property that they seem to acquire enough knowledge and uh, and uh, to some extent, kind of superficial reasoning ability that they are useful as a writing aid, for example. But those systems uh, are still very limited. They don't have any understanding of the underlying reality of the real world, uh, because they're purely trained on text, massive amounts of text. But this may surprise, surprise many people in the audience, but most of human knowledge has nothing to do with language. And certainly, all of animal knowledge has nothing to do with language. And so that part of the human experience is not captured by any of those AI systems. Now, let's see in detail what the limitations are for these systems. They don't have any physical intuition. Um, they don't know how the world works. And that uh, basically stops them from being able to plan actions in the world. So that's one limitation. OK, so making LLMs bigger and training them on more data is not going to get them to reach human intelligence. even. If, some, if in some narrow areas they already seem super intelligent, actually superhuman in, in some level of performance. We have superhuman performance, uh, performance for things like uh, translation of you know, hundreds of languages from in any direction, uh, or um, uh, image recognition for, for various applications. It's, it's, it's superhuman. But those are narrow domains. And uh, the latest techniques in LLM do not change that, uh, that thing. So we have. AI systems now, they can pass the bar exam, um, which is mostly information retrieval. 
Um, but we still don't have level five autonomous driving, something, a task that any 17 year old can learn in about 20 hours of practice. We still don't have domestic robot that can you know, clear up the dinner table and fill up the dishwasher, a task that any 10 year old can learn in, in minutes. Uh, so what that tells you is that we're missing something really big in the AI to kind of reach uh, not just human intelligence, even dog intelligence. The statement is supported by Lecun with some specific examples. So not everything can be put into text. If everything could be put into text, then you could become, let's say, a surgeon or a doctor by just reading books, and you can't. You could become a mechanic by just reading books, and you can't. You could learn to build, I don't know, anything out of wood by just reading books, and you can't. You have to practice. You have to have someone that teaches you. As we have seen in the previous clip, LLM's lack of a relationship between cause and effect, something that was brought up also at the panel on AI in Davos. I mean, they are entirely predictive engines. They're just doing associations. Getting to causality, which is so critical when one interacts with, when one tries to cross the chasm between bits and atoms, that's a huge capability that's missing in current day models. It's missing in models that are embodied. It's missing in the ability of our computers to do common sense reasoning. It's missing when we try to go to other applications, whether it's manufacturing or biology or anything that interacts with the physical world. Aidan Gomez is co-founder and chief executive officer at Cohere, a platform that helps companies to build LLMs. He agrees that the current models are too static, they need to learn to interact with the world, as well as among themselves. If we just keep doing what we're currently doing with autoregressive models, will we make it? And I would agree, the answer is no. Uh, and for the, the reasons that both of you state, which is like grounding and the ability to actually experience the real world, gives you those causal, causal insights. Um, I, I do believe those aren't insurmountable hurdles. And I, I think you both believe that as well. Um, and so I, I think people are working on that. So far, the dumb strategy has worked so well that we've just been able to be like, build a bigger supercomputer, scale up the model, more data, and we get performance. We get extraordinary performance. Yeah. Um, and so what happens when that starts to tire? I think we know what's next. We need online experience. We need to be able to actually interact with the real world. The way these models are deployed today, we do all of this offline training, and offline means there's no interaction with a person, there's no interaction with the environment. Um, and we deploy them, we put them into a, a product. It's static. Yeah. It doesn't learn, it's, it's fixed from there. No, nothing you do changes that model, it's weights. And so that needs to change in order for these things to continuously learn. And the other big hurdle is, we humans, we, we learn through like debate like this, right? We discover new ideas, we, we explore the space of truth and, and what's possible knowledge. Um, models, they need to be able to do that amongst themselves as well. So this idea of self-play uh, and self-improvement. Right now, a major bottleneck, I'm sure Kaifu feels it as well, I'm sure we all feel it, is getting access to data that is smarter than our model as it is. And so humanity and its knowledge is kind of a, a limiting, an upper limit to the current strategy. And so we need to break through that. That it's not just synthetic data and them interacting with themselves in this little box of isolation. They need access to the real world to run those experiments and experience that, to form a hypothesis, test a hypothesis, yeah. fail a thousand times and succeed once, just like humans do, to discover new things. So what does it take to make LLM smarter? Lecun argues that we need a mental model of the world around us. And how can we develop such a model? The answer is simple if you are a parent. Look at how a baby learns. There's a lot of skills that include planning um, that require uh, you know, any, any task that you do consciously, essentially, um, uh, require you to have a mental model of the world uh, which includes the, the kind of physical qualities of the world. And we acquire those models, uh, we form them in our, in our prefrontal cortex when we were babies. We learn how the world works when we were babies by watching the world go by and then interacting with it. Uh, LLMs do not, cannot do this. They, they don't have any sort of high bandwidth perception of what goes on in the world at the moment. Here is an example of a skill that babies learn and that is totally different from the way LLMs process information when they learn. Um, 
you know, your pen has a particular configuration. When you, when you drop it, it's going to follow a particular trajectory. Most of us cannot predict exactly what the trajectory is, but we can predict that the object is going to fall. It takes babies about nine months to figure out that an object that is not supported falls. Okay? Intuitive physics, that takes us nine months to learn when we're babies. How do we do this with machines? Lecun has some numbers to support these points, and here they are. Now, think about what a child sees through vision and try to put a number on how much information a four-year-old child has seen uh, during his or, or her life. And it's about 20 megabytes per second going through the optical nerve uh, for 16,000 uh, wake hours uh, for the, in the first four years of life and, and 3,600 uh, uh, seconds per hour. Uh, you did the calculation and that's 10 to the 15 bytes. So what that tells you is that a four-year-old child has seen 50 times more information than the biggest LLMs that we have. And, and the four-year-old child is way smarter than the biggest LLMs that we have. The amount of knowledge that's accumulated is apparently smaller because it's in a different form. But in fact, a four-year-old child has an enormous amount of knowledge about, uh, about how the world works. You can pause the video at this point if you want to recap the figures mentioned. Lecun is not the first one to suggest exploring the way that babies learn to create a more advanced AI application. There are many studies about how babies learn, and some of the most recent reveal that babies already have a sort of universal knowledge the moment they come to this world. Part of this core knowledge is the understanding of some elements like objects, social beings, but also numbers and geometry, but not words. This core knowledge is what is missing from current LLMs. Elizabeth Spelke is one of the experts in this area, and she believes that humans come with a core universal knowledge from the moment they are born. It suggests that they're learning language in a profoundly different way from uh, the way in which uh, infants are. Uh, first of all, they start out with the specific words where infants are starting out with these universal and much more general abstract uh, properties. But second, infants, when they actually do figure out uh, the meanings of different content words, draw on systems of core knowledge for uh, doing that. Uh, and I submit that core knowledge will not be found in a large language model uh, for two reasons. One is that although it continues to exist in us as adults, uh, it is completely unconscious. If you go back over the history of what people thought was in the minds of infants, you won't find any claims about core knowledge. Nobody thinks babies have it. Nobody thinks they have it uh, themselves. And what's more, if you look at large language corpora, you won't find any words or expressions uh, that capture representations from uh, core knowledge. Uh, we don't talk about uh, core concepts because we can't, because they're uh, unconscious, but also because we don't need to, because they're universal. They're in every baby that's been born and they remain present and functional in all of us. And so the question is, where will the technology breakthroughs come from to make LLM smarter? Certainly not from LLMs themselves, according to Lecun. And so we're missing some essential uh, uh, science and, and new architectures to take advantage of sensory input um, that you know future AI systems would be capable of uh, of, uh, of taking take, you know taking advantage of. Um, so first of all, before we get to human level AI. Uh, we're going to need some breakthroughs that allow machines to understand how the world works, which they can't do at the moment, uh, can remember facts, which they can't really do at the moment, they don't really have persistent memory, at least LLMs don't, um, they can reason and they can plan. And those are characteristics that are essential to intelligent behavior. Current large language models cannot do any of those things, at least not to the level that uh, we'd like them to, to do. The solution, according to Lecun, is to use video to train LLMs, and this is an approach he has been working on for nine years. The results are not reliable yet, and the approach is different than the one used to train neural networks. But there are some indications about what kind of architectures and models are needed. Well, the, the 16,000 hours of, uh, of video I was telling you about, 
that is 30 minutes of uploads on YouTube. I mean, we have way more data that we can deal with. Right. The question is, how do we get machines to learn from video? The task is not as simple as it sounds, and here is why. Uh, what we need is new architectures. When you say new algorithm, it depends what kind of algorithms you're talking about. So the basic algorithm we use for uh, deep learning is called backpropagation to adjust the parameters, right? That's with us. Like, that's going to stay with us. Uh, we don't have any good replacement for this or any even basic idea of how we could replace this. So this works really well. We're going to keep that. So deep learning is here to stay. That's the basis of future AI systems. Um, but what we need are four breakthroughs, basically. Uh, one is um, the ability for systems to learn how the world works, mostly by observation and a bit by interactions, the way babies learn how the world works in the first few, year, few months of life. Um, you can, in principle, do this by training a system to predict. So you show a system. So that's the way LLMs are trained, right? You, you show uh, a large neural network, a piece of text, and you mask the end of the text, and you ask the system to predict the next word in that text. And if the system is properly trained on trillions of, uh, of words, uh, then it can produce the next word, and then you shift that into the input, and it produces the next next word, and etc. It's called autoregressive prediction. That's how all LLMs work today. Now, if you want people, uh, systems like this to understand how the world works, why don't you do this with video? So replace the words by video frames and then ask the system to predict what's going to happen next in the video. Predicting the next frame is too easy. You have to ask it to predict uh, uh, multiple frames. And basically, we don't know how to do this properly. It doesn't work for video. What works for text doesn't work for video. And the only technique that, uh, so far, that has a chance of working for video is a new architecture that I've called JEPA. That means Joint Embedding Predictive Architecture. I'm not going to explain to you what it is. But here is a funny thing. It's not a generative architecture. So, uh, the, so the joke I'm saying is not a joke at all. I really believe this. The future of AI is not generative. A lot of people now are talking about generative AI, like it's you know the kind of the new thing. I think if we find ways to get machines to run how the world works, they're not going to be generative. So we talked about the limitations of LLMs but they remain extremely sophisticated tools that create opportunities. And this is particularly true if you are a startup or an investor. We shouldn't lose sight of the incredible commercial value that exists in the text-based LLMs, right? I mean, they give an incredible pretense of logical reasoning, even common sense. They solve real problems. They can generate content. They dramatically improve our productivity. They're being deployed everywhere. So, you know, as more of a, putting them on, on my more entrepreneur hat, I just see so much value that remains to be reaped. Um, on this opportunity to have a world model, I think that's a great thing for researchers to work on. Um, but I think it's, um, for me, as a startup company, that's something that's a bit farther out. And we'd love to have academia and you know, large company research labs make the discoveries, then we'll follow. At consumer level in particular, LLMs are helping to improve productivity but they're also contributing in making AI a more friendly topic to digest. Let's listen to Sam Altman. I think it's a very good sign that even at these systems' current extremely limited capability levels, you know, much worse than what we'll have this year, to say nothing of what we'll have next year, uh, people, lots of people, have found ways to get value out of them and also to understand their limitations. So, you know, I think it's, AI has been somewhat demystified. Uh, because people really use it now. And uh, that's, I think, always the best way to pull the world forward with a new technology.